And what were the, the group, not quite a party yet, but they were like the country gentlemen, and they wanted to keep the old social order and them on top. What were they? Tories. Tories. And eventually they would become, in fact, that's where the term comes from, keeping that old social order. What would they become? Conservative. Conservative. And then what was called now these merchants in the urban areas, they're making money, they want more representation, they were called, and eventually they would call themselves liberals. liberals. And something about this, um, a lot of these people would be liberals, these merchant, these merchant class and new wealth. And then when they got on top, what did they become? A lot of them became conservative because now I want to stay on top. They wanted, to, they were liberal when they wanted to move up. <laughs> and then once they made it, it's pretty common. You see that a lot, but. Oh, one more thing. I told you about the coonskin cap. Who was the guy who broke the law and, and the squatter who wore the coonskin hat? And this is my Davy Crockett finger puppet with a coonskin hat. And I don't know if you know this, but I am a trained bank You want to see it? Yes. All right. Don't like to brag, but I'm really good. Watch my mouth. You won't be able to see it move. Hi, right, how are you doing? Actually, I tried. Hi, right, how are you doing? Here's the other thing it's magnetic. Yesterday, I was going to mention that my mom had a Daniel Little book that she reads most of her kids. Oh, that's awesome. And um, my dad was had a pretty good memory. I believe it. I mean, they, they, it was such a big deal. And Isaac Newton, Thomas Jefferson. Back then, they all had magnets in them. So and, weird. Man, I'm getting really attached to your puppets. <laughs> no puns. <laughs> so no tons of the lowest form of humor moving on uh we got tories wigs uh death what do we got oh let's go to the current oh we got the sugar app oh what did we call uh that kind of tax where on rum or something it's not you don't pay every time you buy rum but it raises the price yeah books in indirect, right. indirect, indirect. You have it right there. Yeah, indirect tax. And there's a lot of that. Right now, uh, when when um, the, when President Trump was still president, and he raised tariffs, which is the tax on imports on uh, lots of goods from China. And so when you go and let's say you know all of you probably daily buy a washer and dryer. So you go and buy a washer and dryer. Even though it, it doesn't say it's a tax, it's an indirect tax. Because of the tariff, the prices have gone up about an average about like 20 or 30 percent on Washington dryers because of the tariffs from the Trump administration. And the Biden administration has left them on. Complex trade issues and also other things we want to talk about. Okay, so let's get to the currency. Yeah. They banned cloned currency. Did we got to this? Do we just mention this and then the bell rings? Is that about right? Or do we get past this? Did we say all the colonies were issuing their own currency? Yeah, Here's yeah. New York currency. There's all kinds of money floating around. There's a uh... sec. Act busy, everybody. Eh, not working. Sorry, I totally forgot to set something up. I got it done. All right, so there were pesos going around, French money, all this money. In fact, every time you would go, every time there'd be a, a purchase made. And yes, there are merchants, they're kind of like stores, but it would have it would not have made much sense to us today. But when people would buy something, it would almost be haggling. You know, I got one gold shilling. I have a couple pieces of currency from New Hampshire colony. 
I have this Spanish peso. Like, oh, I'll give you this much for it. I mean, every purchase was kind of like that. And there was no set value. You know, yes, the value of money fluctuates, but you know today, you have a dollar, it dollar. That's understandable. Money is relatively stable today. It was just kind of chaotic. And so there was an argument to clean up the system. But almost immediately when they banned this, they said, we will collect our taxes. Remember the Stamp Act, or remember taxes, but they're coming back. The Sugar Act, they must be paid. It would be called hard specie. You see, this is called hard money all the time, but that's specie, just coin. You a coin, the value is within the coin itself, gold or silver. And those are gold shilling. And a very creepy picture of the king here. Oh, no, that's Spanish. Be creepy. Oh, somebody asked this. So we have a you know, queen of England died, and they put the queen on all their money, all the currency, the coins. The money is still good, even if the old, the old queen is on there. Now I know we start to print it in the currency on King Charles III. If you go with, I when I was in England, I remember having coins. I still have coins with King George V. And it's perfectly fine. Just like you can use silver dollars from the 1880s and use it for a dollar. It's a dollar to a percent. Still good. Now, why you'd want to do that? It's kind of crazy. You would a lot more than that, but you can still do it. So back to this. Now, the thing is, all of a sudden, all that other money is worthless because every merchant had to collect gold and silver because they need to pay their taxes. And so you thought you had money, and now it's worthless. And then what happened to the value of the gold and silver coins? Way up. What do we call it when the value of money goes up because there's less money in circulation? Is it inflation or deflation? Deflation. So deflation, the value of money went up. What happens if the value of money goes up? What happens to prices? Prices go down because your money buys more. Now you might think on the surface, hey, that's great. <laughs> value of money or prices are going down. I can buy more stuff. Well, we live in a different world. And sometimes gives kind of a skewed look because as consumers, that might sound good. This is a nightmare for the economy. Think about if you're a farmer. You and farmers are always in debt. Remember, I already kind of told you about that. And all of a sudden you go to bring your corn or whatever it might be to market, and the price is now lower. How are you gonna pay back your debt? How do you pay back your debt if your price is wrong? You don't. Hmm? Yeah, if you owe money, so I owe, I'm, I'm a farmer, I owe money. And so I go sell my crop, corn. I don't make as much money as I thought, so I can't pay back my debt. Or if you're a merchant, you don't get as much money, you can't pay back your debt. Or you can't pay your salaries. Hey, if you're in debt, you're in trouble. And everybody's in debt. And so, Deflation destroys economies. Too much inflation can be bad, but a little inflation is actually really good, really good for economies. If prices are going up, you have this expectation is, hey, I'm going to make this investment today because tomorrow the price is going up. If the prices are dropping, you're like, ooh, I better save my money because I don't know where this is going to end. And so deflation destroys. Now, there's no set term for this, and this is still pre-capitalism. The economy wouldn't have made much sense. In fact, the word wasn't even around yet. But they, we could say depression. Depression means long-term unemployment. Now, jobs as we know it did not exist yet. Yes, people were, they got paid. There was things called wages, but it just, it would not have made sense to us. But just think in terms of, if you didn't have a farm, it was very difficult to find work where you could survive. You weren't making much money in your farm, couldn't pay back your debts. If you're a merchant, you couldn't pay back your debts. It was a crisis, and debtors just went bust. And since most people are farmers or speculators who borrowed money to buy land, and then they didn't, they couldn't sell the land. Think about if you <laughs> bought low, hoping the price would go up and the prices go down. You're in trouble. And we had this a couple of different times in your lifetime. 
pretty bad deflation. Once was the shutdowns of COVID, and that was you know just this mass disruptage disruption. Uh, some businesses were shut down combined with nobody wanted to go out for obvious reasons. And then the other thing was in 2008, 2009, 2010, the financial crash, the yeah, deflation. It was, a, it was awful. 2009 was really the year of deflation. The Great Depression, speculation, all of a sudden the prices tanked and their banks couldn't get their money back. It just was a disaster. There's no banks yet. And so that's what's happening here. Now think about it for a second. They're already kind of raising taxes. Colonies already don't have money, and now they have even less money that's worth it. I should add that this is how countries make their currency value. They collect taxes. Collect taxes in their currency. So you must pay it back in that currency. So no other currency is worth it. The dollar is worth a dollar because they collect taxes. That's why. And that's why any kind of anything else that tries to act like a currency is never really a currency. It's always going to be valued in dollars because that's what the taxes are. For. That's why that cryptocurrency was a scam. I keep coming back to that, but it's such an obvious scam that I always felt bad for people I know. And I know people who like they invested hoping to get rich quick on it. But don't do it. It's a scam. Don't. But of course, the allure of easy money is pretty strong. So, not 18, 1765. 1765, the Stamp Act. So, taxing commodities, hard, hard to enforce. They came up with the idea of letting merchants collect the taxes. And this was a very clever way that has been done for a very long time, and it's done today. And so this would be a direct tax. They will tax everything. So it's not this indirect price is going up. Every time you print a newspaper, receipt, uh, bill of sale, playing cards were kind of very valuable. They would tax each individual playing card, anything printed. And Boston, a lot of merchants, lots of lawyers. If you know anything about lawyers, they put out documents. And so you tax them all. And you have a little royal symbol. And that royal symbol would be stamped on your paper. You have to purchase it. That's how they collect the tax. So you buy something, you get the receipt, you got to pay another uh, 1% to 5%, depending on that. The same. And so they thought, we will collect the tax on everything. This is very much like a sales tax. Very much like a sales tax. Well, this tax is going to hit everybody. Everybody. You know, before the indirect taxes were the taxes they weren't paying, they didn't like the idea of it, they knew there was no money, but now they hit this tax just when they did the currency act. That's when they don't have money. This was hammering them. And they really hit them this idea, okay, they didn't like the tax, but it's our rights of Englishmen, as Englishmen that's being infringed. We have rights. And this is this goes back to the Magna Carta back in 1215 or the English Civil War, where Parliament fought against the king over the power to tax. That was 100 years before that, and that's what they said. Our rights as Englishmen are being infringed. Yes? So, to purchase the stamp, you have to pay money, right? Yes. If you don't purchase it, does that take the document like illegitimate? Uh, so, for example, a legal document would not be legitimate. Okay. Or technically, the merchant was supposed to, not supposed to make a sale. Okay. So or you couldn't buy the newspaper. They wouldn't make a sale. Yeah. So they would be added on to the cost. Oh. Just like when you, if you go to, well, just like you buy a gallon of gasoline. You buy a gallon of gasoline, you're paying along with the cost of 50, almost 50 cents a gallon of gas. Did you know that? You should have a little, there's a little sticker on it that says the gas tax. I know we all just did they just added they just automatically added to the price. But yes. So if you don't pay it, you don't get the gas. So the same thing was happening here. Here's George the Third. This is Latin. This is the document saying it. Our rights as Englishmen. So the colonists are furious. And almost immediately they started saying, now wait a second. Not only is this tax taxing us hard, 
especially people who does a tax like this hit poor people or wealthy people? Yeah, the poor, but it's hitting everybody. It's taxing us hard. If we don't do something today about this tax, what might the British do tomorrow? More tax, more. Or, to, or the big thing they would have said is they'll take more control over our lives. They might start controlling everything. And so what they did is, ironically, this is going to begin the unification of the colonies. And it starts with these protests against the Stamp Act. Now, some were spontaneous, but you could imagine people who were already thinking about this. Who was the guy who protested the Sugar Act and wrote about no taxation without representation? Yeah, James Otis. All of a sudden, these guys like, all right, Otis was right. He was right. But people like Sam Adams started organizing these protests. And they would beat the drum, and they'd come up with hanging the king or government officials in effigy, and just make it to like a big party. And they'd bring big barrels of rum, and people would come out and drink the rum. And so they get more people at the rally and protest the taxes. And they begin to organize this. And the anger they want to make sure was focused on the British. The poor, they're hit the hardest, and most people don't have virtually anything. And the elite, like Sam Adams, want to make sure, let's make sure they're angry at the British and not going like, well, wait a second. How can people like Sam Adams are doing pretty well still? Keep them angry at the British. And the colonial governments, this is, don't think in terms of democracy, this is not a national government. The colonial governments sent a few alike-minded people to a Congress. Nine colonies went. Remember the Albany Plan of Union failed miserably. This one worked. Why? Angry at the British. And they went there to protest this. Now the Virginia legislature did a series of resolutions against it. So they voted for, it's it's not a law, but it's in Virginia's opposed to the Stamp Act and a few other things. These are called resolves. Well, the Virginia resolve would be ratified. And that's what Patrick Henry would say a couple different things. Uh, he also said, give you liberty or give you death. I'll come back to that in a sec. But he also said, no taxation without representation. He took James Otis's line, said that at the House of Burgesses, and they put it in the document. So now it is almost like policy of these colonies. And they also said in there, Virginia should boycott British goods. The Stamp Act Congress, eight of the colonies said, yeah. Now they had no power to, to actually boycott. Boycott means what? Yes. Yeah, not use your box. So they'll take advantage of the fact that they do British merchants need to sell their goods. If they want to suck money out of the colonies, that means the problem that money. Let's get them in their, in their lives. Now, be a sacrifice, but let's do it. And most people were self-sufficient then. Boycotts are harder today because we have to buy everything that's your money. Basically. We are totally dependent. So Remember the royal stamp? They turned that into mocking the stamp with a skull and crossbones. Clever, isn't it? And then I like this one. Here's the king taking it with its policies off a cliff. And you'll notice right here, what kind of hat is that? Yeah, so they have the king and a jester's hat. Yeah. It works now, but like I come in the morning and it doesn't come on. I walk around like five minutes and it'll pop on. Everyone look at those. A lot of eyes will help. And it's getting, well, yeah. And I'm noticing more because it's obviously darker. You know, I first come in the morning, I turned on with bomb, but I, it was still light, so I didn't get pop on after the game. It was about five minutes. This Uh, yeah, that or my second period, the period right before this one, about nine. Okay. 
You got the facts. I came in the morning like, put a light on. See, it's kind of weird. It's eerie. So, boycott British goods. Now, here's the thing. How do you convince regular people to, to do two things? Not buy British goods, but also convince merchants. Don't sell those British goods. Don't get the money to stay. How do you convince them? They have no real power. You find a group of people who might have little conversations with merchants. Have a little talk. Persuade them. The Sons of Liberty. So the Sons of Liberty morality, you notice, it's hard to see it, but these are red and white bars for each of the colonies that went to the Stamp Act Congress. Does that look familiar? Red and white stripes? Hmm. I wonder what's coming. We'll get to that flag there, the middle one there. The U.S. flag, too. I'll get to it. But Sam Adams, not a very successful businessman, but a great organizer. And he was... He was thinking independence. He was a patriot. He wanted to make sure, like, the merchant class was still on top of the colonies. But he began to organize some middle class poor people together to enforce the boycott. Just have friendly little enforcements of the boycott. And they incorporated uh, Ben Franklin's Albany Planet Union sign, which I think is a really clever use of that. This would be used a lot in American history. And they began to organize meetings. And what they would do is they would put out pamphlets and put it out, the true born sons of like, liberty, they would print this out, this is 18, 16, 1765, but look at something about the printing of this time. So one thing about language, there's no dictionary yet. There's no grammatical rules. You know, there's still 40 years from a dictionary. And so it's just kind of winging it. And the little quirks they would do with printing. So this is pre typewriter So that they would have a little tiny um, typeset with each individual letter. They would put the letters in, this little kind of sheet of all the letters, and then they would press this on a piece of paper. Well, they had little things they would do. First off, no grammatical rules. <laughs> when they ran to the end, hyphen, go on. But do you see it? What word is that? It's Tuesday. That's how they would make S's. For some reason, some S's would look to me like a cursive F. So, Tuesday. Uh, the, our desired <laughs> def, uh, to me it looks like defliperter <laughs> public refination <laughs> a refination and then yes yeah there are no rules are you wrong this it's not an s is that an f it has a legacy has anyone taken german and saw that s that you know the kind of b looking thing which is a double s it has that similar legacy and it just kind of disappeared. It's kind of too bad. Yeah. But is it double the hmm? Is it double the public? Yeah, that was just purely a mistake by the person printing it. They didn't know they got to hear them. They're, they're doing little tweezers and putting in the letters. <laughs> they just made a mistake. Da -da. That's that, I think, yeah. Is that right? I think so, yeah. And so, they did this, and they would meet at, they designated spots around a tree, always a maple tree, and they called it the Liberty, Liberty Tree. I know this looks like a little puppet, but it's supposed to be the king or somebody hanging in an effigy. And <laughs> hanging in effigy, so they would get up, up like a stuffed thing and eat. That was probably the, or maybe Governor Hutchinson or somebody. The French Revolution would do the same thing. And so if you go to New England towns, there's like places, even if it was a maple tree, like this was the spot. So I'm still st standing of the Liberty Tree. And you go to French cities, they, they copied the same thing during the French Revolution two decades ago. A Liberty Tree with a maple tree. And then how do you enforce that? What would their persuasion techniques be? Yes.
and and threat and carrying out. <laughs> yeah, you're about right. Yeah, violence. They would rough them up. It would be the, are you sure you want to do that? Are you sure? Yeah, yeah that's a bit. Yeah, that's a that's a nice arm you have. I see it broken. And so they would rough them up, beat them up, threaten them. And all you need to do is to beat up a couple of people. People kind of catch the work. And what would they do with the merchants? They would tar and feather them. Now, tarring and feathering is an age old process. So they mention it in the video, and they, and they would tar and feather and humiliate them. I like that in the video. No, this is an amazing process. So they would grab somebody, and the process, they're roughing them up. I mean, they're, they're hurt. And then they rip their clothes off. They usually shear their hair off. Yeah, I might get a little bit of the ear with that. You're clipping that thing off. And then do what? Dump. They would dump boiling hot tar, tar on you. Not a lot, but some. Boiling hot. So it could potentially kill you. I mean, can you imagine that tar getting on there? And once it cools, what happens? It's, yeah, it sticks. How do you get it off? You take much of your muscle with it. At least the skin, and it hurts really bad. It's, and it just sticks and it feels horrible. And then they dump feathers on you. That has a couple purposes. First off, it makes you look stupid. But secondly, the feathers will stick and add to the, pleasant, the pleasantness of the whole thing. Itch, stick in there, dig in. And then they ride you out on a rail. Now, this was at a time of split rail fences. This is pre barbed wire, pre wire fences. So someone to designate their land, they get long poles. Long poles, and that's called a rail. And yes, they would take that term rail and use it for when they had, when train would be invented in England the next century. These long poles. And then they would have, imagine a long pole, and then they would two small poles to kind of make them an X, stick them in the ground here, and here, and just string the pole across. Thus, a fence. You take that long pole, and after you punish this guy, he's naked, miserable, they're throwing stuff at him. They take that pole, they make a straddle of a pole like this. They take six or seven guys on each side, and then they take the pole and they lift him up, and they kind of bounce him on the pole. Now, we're not gonna get into the whole anatomy issue, but let's be clear about something. It's gonna hurt really bad. And then they take him out of town and they throw, Think how much manure there would be on the streets in a town in the 1760s. Everywhere, along with chamber pots. You know what a chamber pot is? Yes, and then you, yeah. So let's put it this way. They're throwing unpleasant things at him. Um, I'm looking for a volunteer to be a merchant now. Anybody want to collect this? Yeah, <laughs> I'll do it. And it's fun for us, so yeah. But we always want volunteers. <laughs> you see what's going to happen? Because you'll be targeting better than that. <laughs> oh, you just volunteered. <laughs> Doesn't change our point of view. Okay, so, and here they're attacking the governor's home and burning his furniture. Needless to say, nobody wanted to sell anything. And it worked. The Stamp Act was repealed. <laughs> Merchants who were wigs, even though they're the minority, said we're losing money. This is failing miserably. And a lot of them, like William Pitt, who's still in Parliament, he said, I told you this was going to fail. And here is a couple of different things. First off, the tea pot with Stamp Act repeal. I just find that amusing. They got that. Yes, we won. I want this tea pot. Here is just like a funeral procession. And it's anti stamp act, and they're taking the colonies, the British are taking them to a mausoleum. And the dog is okay. <laughs> and here is this is supposed to represent Lady Columbia, and they made him this person who's going to be, they represented the Americas. And then for the first over 100 years of the United States, Lady Columbia was like the symbol of the US. You might think of like Uncle Sam. No, it was Lady Columbia first. And here's what British policy did. They're killing them. It worked. 
But the British respond with what's called the Declaratory. And the Declaratory Act said this, all right, you won the Stamp Act, but we're still in charge. We can still pass another law. This was really a very childlike thing. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, well, we're still in charge. I'll get you. So Parliament's saying, you might have won this battle, but we're still going to win this war. The colonies will bow down to us. Here's another problem. First off, call them. Many in Parliament, the Tories are mad. How dare they not follow our order? We're on top. We were born this way. We're better than them. They should follow us. The legacy of those people are the same kind of people who are like, um, love kings and queens. Yeah. And think about in the colonies. If you're going around tarring and feathering people, and you have people broken up in different groups and they're fighting and are not really an argument. I mean, this is like violent bloodshed. You can't go back. You can't all of a sudden say, hey, that was wild, wasn't it? Let's be friends again. And the other thing is, once you ratchet up the violence, what happens the next time? You don't start at the beginning. Where do you start? Where? And you see this time after time. We'll really see it in the 1850s, the events leading up to the Civil War. We'll see it to a lesser degree in the 1970s. I, I follow this time stuff. We were seeing an elements of that today. Yes. It was nothing more than a, a law by a Parliament passed this law that simply said, hey, we're, we are still in charge of the colonies. We're still in charge. So if we want to pass another tax, we can do it. Just because we repeal this doesn't mean we're not coming back. And we're coming back. The next year, the Townshend Acts. Charles Townshend, member of Parliament. So the cabinet for the prime minister are members of Parliament, still are today. He was the Treasury Secretary, or as the British called him at this time, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, which is an awesome name. They passed, let's do it again. Another duty, this is a tax, and they listed out these commodities, tobacco, rum, sugar, all these, and they'll put a tax on again. They're going to try it again. So a little bit more than the Sugar Act. So going back to the old Navigation Acts, now they cut the taxes again, but they're going to try to enforce them. So they're thinking, okay, the direct tax failed, let's go back to indirect tax. But this time, it's too late. And almost immediately, we have the same organization and the same boycott, the same tarring and feathering and torturing. Here are colonists reading this. Yeah. Yeah, that has to be a really good point. It's amazing how many times people do the same wrong thing over and over again. But every time they do it, they all think, well, this time's good. This time is different. This time. And there's a man in Pennsylvania. Yes. Wait to this. A very prominent lawyer by the name of John Dickinson. Now, I want to make sure you got this down. John Dickinson. Now, he's a lawyer, not, I mean, not famous, but a relatively prosperous lawyer. He would write the letters from a Pennsylvania farmer. And here's a copy of it right here. This creepy um, thing is John Dickinson, where he laid out that this is depriving us of our rights, and we should decide our own fate. We, want, we are Englishmen. We want to be in the empire. And so it will say right here in this, the patriotic American farmer, John Dickinson. He was not a farmer. He just was trying to act like a common man. Ironically, this would encourage a lot of patriotic thought. And a lot of people would think he was for perhaps breaking away totally. As it turned out, no, he was not. And he fought hard against independence. So ironically, his writing would help lead to patriotism, you know, lead to the patriot movement and independence. He didn't want that. And so with that, quick go again. And so, in Boston, the Sons of Liberty were the strongest, and they're roughing up people. Part of the Townshend Acts was this um, 
uh, was a law called the Quartering Act that would allow the quartering of troops in people's homes to enforce the tax. So as soon as they start the boycott and start roughing people up and attacking the governor's house, they sent troops, over 800 troops, eventually over 1,000 troops. And what they would do is the officers would stay in the homes of usually pretty wealthy, usually loyalists. But where would the private stay? In yeah. Working people's homes. And they would stay in these homes. Now, about 20 to 30% of people didn't have a home. Either at temporary shelters, or I'll tell you more about it. There's a lot of really poor people. Oh, yeah. But I'm but they wanted this wasn't just find a place to live. They wanted soldiers in the homes. Because if there's a soldier in the home, what does that keep people from doing? Don't they have to kind of censor themselves? But you got a spy within. You got somebody within. Courting of troops was to control people. You put people. Imagine putting some kind of police power in your home. How would you act? How would you act? How would you act if everything you said or did, your parents knew and heard? Everything. And your parents <laughs> love you and are nice, but still, do you want them to know everything you say? But how would you ask if everything you say or think is being listened? Watched. What did you try to act like the way they want you to act? Therefore, you're not free. This is why when James Madison wrote the First Amendments to the Constitution to be ratified by Congress, we now dubbed them the Bill of Rights. The Third Amendment is no quartering of troops. None of those amendments were just simply because, hey, that's not like a good thing in Astra. It happened. But it's more than that. So think about these poor people in Boston, where most of these privates are living. What kind of home do they live in? A small little home, usually one room, always short of heat. It's cold there. How many beds are there in this home? What? The poor would have a cloth mattress, usually filled. Okay, if you're really poor, it's hay. You got a little bit of money, it's swapped. And if you're really wealthy, it's a um, down. Use your duck pants. So it's the most stray, uh, a straw or hay mattress, which had to be really comfy. And this would be one bed. And the whole family would sleep in that bed together, partially because of room, partially because of heat. Yes, their ideas of privacy might be different than our idea of privacy. You can get at that. And so you have husband, wife, two kids, and now a private. All in the same. Oh, yeah. And what might happen for at least a lot of people think? Going with this, <laughs> yeah. And it just even if it didn't happen, they have bodies. And there's something else. What was discipline? And this, I mean, in, think about privates. Remember, I told you about discipline. They had to line up in a line, and the enemy shooting at their face. What was discipline like in the British Army? For the most minor offense, they're whipped. Does anybody know what a cat of nine tails is? What is it? Is it? A cat of nine tails was nine things. That when you were whipped for a single batch, you get nine things. Yeah, so you get a handle and they tack nine whips on it. So one lash is like nine. And you might see that put a little like, piece of metal on, but you're really good. They do. But they could, but even think about it for a second. Ten lashes not to be fatal anymore. And they were a little tougher, you know, that different older generation, my generation, we were tough. But <laughs> no, it would, so for the most minor offense, I mean, literally like getting out of step for one step in the march, that's five lashes to the cabinet. So think about discipline that harsh with 
British privates are treated like dirt, and now they go in this home and wear a jacket. Think about this. And you can imagine how the colonists, the people of Boston, just hated these soldiers. Nobody likes an occupied home. Nobody. I think how much resent we would have, but it doesn't matter who they were, an army was inside our city. Especially if they're from a different place. Especially if they speak a different language, but unfortunately, just wait till there's Germans occupying the American city. Actually, we'll get to that. Well, what did they start calling these soldiers? Well, red coats, but that's not really it. Someone said it. In Boston? What's that? Say it again. Even. <laughs> Mine, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but that was just, regular meant they were just a regular enlisted soldier, not militia. Lobster bats. And that infuriated the British soldiers. Why do they call them lobster bats? Good guess, but no. Oh, their bats. Think about their backs with all the scars. It looks like a lobster's back. That wasn't a, you know, like, hi, soldier. It's a major insult. It infuriated them. So they're yelling at them. Soldiers were told, don't go out alone or you'll be jumped and you'll be beaten up. There's just all this resentment, and it gets worse. All the poor there, they're looking for work. Now, wages aren't like we think of today. It's not, it's so pre-capitalism. But the poor had to take some kind of jobs. Well, soldiers were taking those jobs, too. They had some free time. They're not paid very much. And so they would do things like making rope. Rope was something that anyone could do. You just take these, they would make twines, and then they would take the twines and spin them together. together. You make rope all by hand. And they need rope all the time. Soldiers were taking that job, those jobs from poor people. If all of a sudden more soldiers are going for the same job that the poor in Boston wanted, what happened to the wages they were giving for rope? Drop it. So they're hurting people that way too. And 20 to 30% of the people don't live in a home. Where do they live? Yeah. And so think about these poor houses. The poor house, think about a room this big, hastily made, no heat. How about this big? How many people could sleep in here? Oh. They, they wouldn't <laughs> stack. Right here. Well, you take a rope, you bring the rope from here, and you string that in. Two feet, another rope, another rope. So you get this idea of these ropes strung across. Do you get know where I'm going with this? And the poor would come in, especially in the winter. And they would come in and walk down these little aisles between rope until the shoulder to shoulder. And then sleep out them. They found them all to hold them up. So you could pack hundreds in here, couldn't you? And there's a lot of people like that, and now their jobs are being taken by the soldiers. You see the anger building. So every time a soldier would go out, they're attacked. There was a, a in February 1770, uh, soldiers opened fire in a crowd and killed an 11 year old boy. Three months later, the Boston Massacre. Now, we don't know exactly what happened. There was one soldier they were throwing. We already talked about what kind of stuff they'd be throwing, right? It was, it was dark. Nobody knew what time it was then, so people got up and went to everything they wanted to. Remember, this is pre capitalism. And they're throwing all this stuff. He panicked. Uh, a squad, eight more soldiers came. Somebody opened fire. We don't even know what happened, but this kind of represented pretty well. It was chaos. It was right in front here. There's a little plaque right there that says where it happened in the Boston. 11 people were hit, five died. Christmas Addicts was killed, and it shows kind of the variety of people that were there. Christmas Addicts was. A, was a former slave of both African and European descent. And we know we talk about the fornication laws. Almost everybody who was enslaved in America was of African and European descent. Already talked about why. And he was murdered right here. And so this would become a big deal during the abolitionist movement. There weren't very many abolitionists, abolitionists in the US before the Civil War, but they were centered around Boston. So that's what they tried. So this was from the 1850s. Yeah. 
I thought that everybody thought that the people were slaves were like worse than their like their plot was they were like so inferior. Why would it matter that a slave got shot at a Well, in the 1850s, they're, they're trying to use this as justification for freeing slaves. They were fighting for freedom. So that's 1850s. That's when that picture was drawn. In the 1760s, you brought up a really good point. Because what kind of people are making up this crowd? The lower class. Oh. So you brought up a good point. John Adams would use that in his defense. It's a very good point. So what was the British reaction to this? Oh, first off, last thing for today. Colonial, would, the colonists would use this. I should have put patriot propaganda, but I didn't. So think patriot. I see propaganda, all of you, you, have, you innately kind of know what it is. Because you're inundated with propaganda all the time. Well, let's get a good definition and we have to finish this on Monday after the quiz. How many questions will be on the quiz? Eight. Oh, only eight then. You want more? Yeah, finish. I'll put it up on. I would have been done, but I, I, I totally forgot I had to send something to somebody and I had to do it. So you guys have to watch it, act busy. You know, try your best to get through the weekend. I know it's going to be tough not seeing me for two days. Okay. I, I feel your pain. I'm with me all the time, so I don't really have that issue, but have a good weekend, everybody. Bye, thank you. Right when you find work. And hang by your thumb. What that means either, but I didn't. see ya. Bye again. Out of nine tails. And that's actually a really good point you said about that. John Adams. I'm so I'm glad you said that. Unfortunately, the bell had to couldn't quite finish it, but. Remember what he said? I'm not actually getting it. It's like, it's, it's, I'll give it some. Thanks. Are you sure? I'll tell you. Thanks. Well done. Very hot. With your elbow, he said, if you step over it, uh, so people like to eat, right? Yeah. Yes. I can't see the elbow. The elbow. No. Go! Dirt? I like Venus. Charlie Brown Christmas is still the best Christmas show ever. But he wouldn't say that. Even if you're a druid, you still gotta like him. I'm going to break. 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 I'
No, no, Friday. The room is hot. Yeah, the room is hot. He said that. Oh. The room is hot. Sit, hey, the room is hot. Repeat after me. The room is hot. See? You just warmed up five degrees. See, that's the power of positive thinking. You see, the glass is half full. Yesterday it was. When we turn the fan on. All righty then. Do you the story of the room? No. About eight years ago, not maybe it's that long ago, I came back in the summer, and there's this room. Room. Right, send it over there, thinking someday they'll come back and take the room. Wherever you when they're cleaning the room, the room has been there for eight years. Someday they're going to come take their room. I think they come walk in and go, oh, yeah, it's a room. It's been right here. I'm waiting for somebody to take it's a it's a sociological experiment. No, you can't have my room. No, it might get dirty. It's actually, but I no, it just sits there. And so what happened was, so like they come in you know, every year, they there is somebody clean the rooms and they wax the floors and do that. I have a picture of my room up where I have all the desks are and everything so they can put it back the way it kind of close the way it was. It actually said in the corner, room. <laughs> Not there. Someday they're going to take that room. I got a few more years left before I retire. I'm wondering if it's going to make it. I've heard something really weird. Where? Okay, so we have a quiz tomorrow. I'm coming in tomorrow. I don't quit. There's no off switch here. I work and work. We have a quiz what day? Monday. I. It's just going to be a little matching quiz. Uh, there are. 94 questions. Some of them you're gonna have to draw a picture of it, and I want it to scale. One inch equals one inch. So make sure I want I want good art. I want good stuff from all of the twins. This works. 